You ever heard this phrase? Expectation versus reality. Expectation versus reality. Look at an internet meme. You see it all over the place. And you see people like there's this expectation picture, and then normally the reality picture is like a hot mess. And so that's kind of the, the, you know, the contrast there. The expectation is like I'm going to have a really romantic evening with my spouse. We're all going to get dressed up fancy. We're going to go to like, I don't know, an Italian restaurant. There's going to be candles and chocolates and, and flowers, and it's going to be super great. The reality is it's like, you know, 8 o'clock on a Tuesday, and you're in your pajamas, and you're trying to help your kid with Common Core math, and they're too smart because you can't help them. And like, you know, some Somebody else is in the background, and one of you is not even home yet because something went wrong at work. That's reality, expectation versus reality. The whole idea of the meme is that like, life, life lets us down sometimes. Like we, don't, we don't get exactly what we want. Or maybe for you, you imagined, like me, your favorite NFL football team going all the way this year. Because this is our year, guys. It's our year, right? Any team. Some of us went farther than others. He invited me to his house so I could get beat by his team. <laughs> And then, unless you're a Kansas City Chiefs fan, eh, you lost. <laughs> Expectations versus reality. We hope that something will be a certain way, but it doesn't always add up. And the same thing happens with people. There's this phrase, have you heard this phrase, never meet your heroes? You know what that means? It means that, it means that people are going to let you down. You know, we put people on pedestals, and we're like, man, this person is so great. And I'm a mon- mentor and a role model, and I look up to them in every way. And then when you actually meet them, they're kind of jerks, uh, you know, or maybe they're short with you, or maybe they weren't as cool. Maybe they're really short. You're like, I imagine you taller. Huh, I don't know why that disappoints me. Like, it's like these things happen to us. And so athletes and celebrities, maybe an author or just someone that you've looked up to, um, and then you're let down. And, and I, I remember meeting a hero of mine. He's a, a famous Christian musician. And like, I was like following him and really into him. So this is about 20 years ago. I, and I went to a, a show and I got to I had a meet and greet afterwards, and I was so underwhelmed. <laughs> I was just like, oh, man, I just imagined you being so much nicer and differenter than that. And, you know, like, to be fair, there was like 100 other people trying to, like, get his autograph and bug him and get on his nerves. And, like, looking back 20 years later, I've decided to forgive this person who will remain unnamed because, like, you know, it's a busy thing. He's probably like an introverted artist who really doesn't like talking to people, and, like, he's like, I got to do this because it's expected of me. But the expectations don't line up with the reality, and sometimes we find ourselves disappointed. And so I kind of want to ask a question, just an open-ended question for you today. Like, you came to church today, okay? And we are Christians at this church, okay? So even if you don't claim Jesus as, as, uh, as your faith, like you're not into Christianity, but you're here, okay? So I want you to know this is a Christian place, mostly Christian people, but all of us are here, and here's my question. What are your expectations of Jesus? Well, I grew up in the South. Jesus' name is all over the place. We lived in Norfolk, Virginia a while, and I remember all these uh, stickers people put all over the place that says, Jesus saves. And I, I can imagine, like, if you didn't really grow up in church or know about Jesus, you'd be like, Jesus saves what? Like, saves taxes? Like, what, what's Jesus saving? Is it a coupon? I mean, not to make anybody dumb, but seriously, we just say stuff about Jesus, but, like, if you've never, like, read stories about him or been taught about him, like, you just kind of have to come up with your own expectations. Right? He's pretty, he's a good teacher. Like, I heard he was, like, maybe some sort of prophet. Some people say that he's God in the flesh. Like, what are your expectations of Jesus? That's just an open-ended question. Who is he? What do you expect from him? Uh, There's this moment in the Bible that I want to look at today where that question is asked of somebody. And it's our guy, Peter. So uh, we're in week three of this teaching series we're calling Trailblazer, following Jesus like Peter did. And we've been looking at the life of a guy named Peter, uh, the Apostle Peter, uh, and just seeing, like, what is it that made him who he was? Like, he has left a legacy. Peter becomes, uh, he's one of the first missionaries to the world. He was an apostle, a disciple, a person who followed Jesus, who was a student of Jesus himself, and then went out as an apostle to be sent out with a message. And so, like, he was kind of an early front runner. He was a trailblazer that helped establish the church. We Peter's the guy, he gets to be in Jesus' closest inner circle with just like two other people. Like he was probably one of Jesus' closest human friends on this earth. So we had kind of an inside track on this very famous, important person named Jesus. And then we get to see Peter experience some amazing things like last week where Peter got to walk on top of water the Sea of Galilee, like he got to do that. Like that's pretty crazy. Uh, we find that Peter is the guy that God chose to bring the first sermon on the first day of church ever. The book of Acts in the Bible, chapter 2, is the day of Pentecost. It's a Jewish holiday, but a lot of people were gathered around, and the big hubbub was that this guy Jesus had just been crucified. People are now saying he's risen from the dead. What's going on? And this guy, Peter, steps up in this huge crowd and gives this amazing, powerful sermon. And over 3,000 people were like, I'm convinced. That's Peter. He gets to give that sermon. That's pretty cool. 
He becomes one of the first leaders of the church. But he wasn't always that way. How did he get here? So we're following his story and watching him grow up as a trailblazer in the kingdom of God at the church. This morning, uh, we're going to look at the day that Peter got his name. I told you last week, Peter wasn't his given name. Uh, he was born and named Simon, okay? Simon. Uh, his dad's name was Jonah. We're going to learn in a minute. Very Jewish names, okay? He's Simon, but there's a time that he's, call, he's called Peter. Peter's actually a Greek name, a Greek word. Uh, it's likely that Jesus never called him Peter in Greek because Jesus probably spoke Aramaic. Our New Testaments were written primarily in Greek. Did you know this? And so as they're translated and passed around in the first century world, the common language, much like today, it's English around the world. Back then it was Greek, a type of Greek called Koine Greek. But the local Jewish people, they spoke mostly Aramaic and some Hebrew. So anyway, he was probably called Cephas by Jesus, which is the Hebrew translation, the Aramaic translation of, of Peter, Petros. So this is the name he gets this day. So we're going to find this. Okay, so if you've got your Bible, grab it. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 16, starting at verse 13. I want to encourage everybody to grab a Bible, look it up on your phone, or read it on the screen behind me. All year long, I've just really been encouraging us to be a church that brings our Bibles and takes notes, uh, because there's something that happens in our brains when we look uh, in, in different uh, learning fashions, reading, writing, stuff like that. If you need a Bible, we've got a shelf by the door. You're welcome to go grab it anytime. Grab it on your way out and keep it. You can have it if you need a Bible. I'll just put it back up there when you're done. And we're going to be in Matthew chapter 16, starting at verse 13, and we're going to find Jesus and his disciples, his followers, a long way from home. Typically, when you see Jesus teaching and traveling, he's in a, an area that's kind of the southern area of their realm called Judea, near Jerusalem, or the northern region that they traveled in was called Galilee. Last week we were in Capernaum, which is right on the Sea of Galilee, and that's kind of like the northern stretches of where he traveled. But today he's actually 25 miles further north. This is a time when you walk by foot to get places, okay? So he's a long way from home. And he's actually in a region that's not primarily Jewish. He's in a region that's primarily Gentile, non-Jew, and their faith was primarily like pagan. They, they worship different idols and different spirits and gods and beings and stuff like that. So they're up at this place in, called Caesarea Philippi, and this is a very Roman, Greek, non-Jewish area, and it's really cool too because up there was this like hot spot for spiritual activity. It was kind of this cave, and they call it the Gate of Hades. And in this space, it was like where maybe oracles would go, and people would go to worship and do sacrifices, and so Jesus takes them up to this kind of bizarre, outlier, pagan area because he's got a very special lesson he wants to teach his disciples. Far away from home, fish out of water, let's see what they have to say. So here we go. This is Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 13. Let's just look at this first line. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Son of Man was a nickname he began to use for himself. And it's got a lot of history. We won't get into it. But it so he's like, who do people say that I am? Who are, are people talking about me? What are they saying? Now, the disciples have been following Jesus for quite a long time now, and a lot of people had already made some proclamations about Jesus. Let's just take a little journey and look at them, because this isn't the first time someone had to guess, like, what's Jesus up to? Most of the time, they just called him rabbi, which means teacher. But let's go all the way back to the very beginning of Jesus' journey in his public ministry. If you look in John chapter 1, verse 29 and verse 34, you meet this guy named John the Baptist. John the Baptist is... He's a teacher before Jesus. He's a little bit older than Jesus. He, he comes to prominence before Jesus, and he's actually kind of the front runner of Jesus' ministry. He had a very big following. People would travel way outside of Jerusalem, walk down this crazy, it was like a 400-foot decline from the elevation where Jerusalem was down to the Jordan River where John the Baptist would be teaching, and the guy was, he was eccentric, but people were captivated by him. And he would teach, and he had a lot of disciples. In fact, a lot of Jesus' first disciples were actually John's disciples first. Because John was like, all right, here he is. Here's the guy that I've been telling you about. <laughs> Y'all go follow him now. That's pretty cool. I don't know if you ever thought about that. Like John was a front runner in many ways, but one was because a lot of his followers became Jesus followers. Well, John's the first person to publicly identify Jesus in some, who, do you, who are people saying the Son of Man is? This is what John the Baptist says. Uh, in verse 29, he says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. There's this sacrificial language there. A lamb was something that was used in temple systems. To, you know, you'd, you'd slaughter a lamb and their blood would symbolically cover your sin. He's like, there he is. That's a, kind of a crazy phrase. And then he says in verse 34, he said, I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. 
And that word there is deeply ingrained in like their Old Testament system of kings. Like when you want to be the leader of Israel, you get anointed. There's oil involved. There's prayer involved. There's a ceremony. And by being anointed, you become the chosen one. Now, some people really thought that that meant Jesus was going to be like a political leader. He's going to step up and be a new king. It's been a long time since they had a king. Maybe a military leader, fight the Romans, get them out of here. Talked to how Peter last week, he's a zealot, that's his political party, and he basically wants to fight the Romans all the time. But this is what John the Baptist says. He's God's chosen one. He's the anointed one. We're going to see that come up in a, in a minute. Who does John say Jesus was? That's what he says. There's a belief among some Jews, not all Jews, but for many Jews at this time, for years, that there had been a prophesied chosen one, a Messiah figure. And John is saying, this is him. Okay, so this has been said. This is at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. And then it happens again. So if you look a little bit further, actually in this same story, the next person to kind of make a proclamation about who Jesus is, is a guy named Andrew. You heard of Andrew? It's pretty cool. He's very pivotal to our story, because we're doing a study on the life of Peter. Andrew was actually a disciple of John the Baptist. He must have been there that day when John uh, identifies Jesus. It's a really cool story because Jesus actually comes down to John. John baptizes him to kind of uh, inaugurate this new ministry. And the Holy Spirit shows up and there's a voice from heaven. It's a big thing and a lot of people were there. And Andrew must have seen this because he runs home and he tells his brother. You know who his brother was? A guy named Simon. Oh, you might know him as Peter. You know who won Peter to Jesus? His brother. And so just so you know, like if you've had a hard time, like, and you're like, I don't know if I'm like a leader in the kingdom of God. I don't know how to like speak publicly. I don't know how to do a lot of things like some of these big leaders do. Maybe you don't have to be. Maybe you just need to be the one who goes and gets your friend who is. That's what Andrew does. Andrew says this, John 1, 41. The first thing Andrew did was to go find his brother, Simon. That's Peter. We have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. Andrew says Messiah. Uh, quick lesson here. Messiah is a Hebrew word. I think it's like Mashiach, and it's like the word Messiah. It means the anointed one, the chosen one. But if you translate it to Greek, you know what the word is? Christos, Christ. And so Christ is not Jesus' last name. Jesus Christ is not like Jesus Christ is his last. No, it's, it's a title. So anyone that called him the Christ would be saying, I, I believe you're that anointed one. So Andrew believes that. He tells his brother Peter. We see some of John's followers do the same thing, other followers. A guy named Philip. Philip's very important. Uh, he's going to become a disciple of Jesus. He's actually going to be the one that's responsible for helping to take the message of Jesus to the continent of Africa. He meets an Ethiopian guy, converts him, baptizes him, and that guy goes home, and we believe that that's where the Ethiopian church began, which to this day is still one of the strongest churches in the world, the Ethiopian church. Pretty cool stuff. In John 1, 45, we find Philip. And Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. And so this is neat. Not only is some other people calling him the Messiah, the chosen one, the anointed one, Philip identifies him and connects him with like Moses. It's like, dude, the old school, the OG leaders of our whole family, this is who they were talking about and the prophets. So people have already identified Jesus. Then Nathaniel himself declares that he believes. And so we see that in verse 49, John 1, 49. Rabbi, rabbi is a word that means teacher. Rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. I can't let you miss this political language. They really believe he's going to step up and be a king. Jesus has a big surprise for them coming. It's not just a king of this little area. It's like the king of the entire world. The kingdom of God. So when Jesus asked this little group of disciples, he takes them up 25 miles north of Capernaum and he pulls them to the side and he says, who do people say that I am? Well, he knows who people say that he is. He's heard it. But the question now is like, now that you've been traveling with me for a while, you've walked on water, you saw a dead guy wake up, you see me feed thousands of people with just a little boy's lunch. You see me do miracle after miracle after miracle. You've heard me teach. You've heard me, you know, kind of talk to the, to the religious leaders who are leading people astray. You've heard all this. Now that you've seen that, I want to ask you a question. Have your expectations met up to reality? Who do you say that I am now? You've all been saying this stuff for a long time. 
But I wanted to leave you from the comfort of home, and I want you to bring you out here, and I want to ask you a very simple question. Who do people say that I am? Verse 14. So they reply. They say, well, some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Some say Jeremiah. Now, at this point, it's important to realize all three of these people are, are dead. And the Jews did not believe in reincarnation. So they're not literally saying, well, I think that you're probably the reincarnated Jeremiah. Like, they're not saying that. But what they're saying is, people are saying that you're a lot like these people. We recognize the way that you act. So Elijah, Jeremiah, John the Baptist, all three of them were very bold uh, leaders who would go out and say bold things and, and make claims for God. They were able to do miraculous things by God's power. They were willing to corrupt, I mean, uh, confront corrupt leaders and tell them, call them out. And so these are the things that Jesus is doing. They're like, dude, you're, you're really like one of those heroes that we have. It'd be for like a Republican in America to be like, man, this guy sounds like uh, Ronald Reagan. He sounds like Abraham Lincoln. Like you'd really be tying to some great figure in your party. Or for a Democrat to say, man, this guy's like JFK. He's like FDR. Like we really respect that. You see that, what I mean? So they're like, this guy, man, he's acting like John the Baptist. He's acting like Elijah. That's who people say that you are. What was the question? Who do other people say that you are? He's going to flip the coin on them. Sometimes this happens with my kids. Uh, there'll be like a fight, and my kids are arguing with each other, and I'll get them together, and I'll be like, okay, uh, what happened? What did you do? And the first thing my son will tell me is that, well, my sister did such and such, and the first thing my daughter will tell me is like, well, he did this. He said that. And I'm like, I didn't, t- I didn't ask you what they said. I didn't ask you what they did. Now I want to know what you did. What was your responsibility? Jesus is going to do a classic dad move, and he's going to just turn the question for, okay, what are other people saying? Okay, that's fine. And he asked him in verse 15, what about you? Who do you say that I am? So today, I want to ask you, Venture Church family, who do you say Jesus is? Who is he to you? As kids and teens, we might go to church or claim a faith or religion because our parents took us to church or took us somewhere else if you've been part of another religious group. You know, your grandma might have told you, like, this is what you believe. This is what we believe. We all believe this. And so as a kid, you're like, oh, okay, I guess we believe that. Um, that's why I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan, to be honest. My dad was like, this is how we do it at our house. I'm like, well, all right, yes, sir. We just do it because we're kids, and we do what our parents tell us to do. There comes a time, though, as we grow up that we, we find a role with the crowd a little bit more. And so maybe you kind of came to your, your decision to be a Christian or to go to church at least, because somebody else is doing it, someone that you like, someone that you respect. <laughs> I got friends who go to church because they, they, that's where the pretty girls were, and that's where they wanted to go. And they're like, okay, all right, I'm in for Jesus now. That's it, I'm it. Like, so it might be another thing. And then as you grow older, another thing that we see a lot is that as parents, uh, we might tend to bring our children to church. Not because we super believe it or it's super deeply ingrained in us, but because we just need to make sure our kids get some religion. And we think that that's probably good for them. And so maybe that's why you're here right now. I don't know. Like I'm really, or maybe you're here because your spouse, your boyfriend, and your girlfriend brought you, and it's kind of expected. Or maybe you're a college student, and you dropped in because your parents are like, they can track your phone, and they see that you're at church right now. I'm like, all right, cool. I'm going to not bug you. I literally spoke to a mom at CCYC this weekend whose, whose kid lives in uh, Wilmington. was like, hey, uh, I watch my kid. I'm going to make sure they go to church. I'm like, dang, that's, what a time to be alive. Um, who is Jesus to you? And I want to tell you this, like, if you don't know the answer to that question, that's fine. Maybe you haven't thought about it. But it's a big deal. Maybe he used to mean something to you and you realize as I ask you, huh, he doesn't mean what he used to. Or maybe he means nothing to you, but you came because you kind of are curious. And so we try to be a church family that's like, look, you don't have to check your baggage at the door. You don't have to leave your questions at home. Bring them. Let's fight through this together. Let's get with somebody. Let's just chomp it out. There's books we could recommend. There's studies we could do. There's just conversations we could have. Maybe that's where you are, but I just think it's important to ask the question, who do you say that I am? One of my favorite stories about this is uh, the very famous author and theologian, C.S. Lewis. Um, They say that a good preacher has to quote C.S. Lewis at least once a month. Uh, I must not be a good preacher. I don't do that very often, but the quote I want to give you is one that it's been years since I've said, but C.S. Lewis's story is that he becomes a great, a a preeminent theologian in his generation in the the last century. I mean, he was just up there he wrote a lot of books he wrote some fun books the lion the witch and the wardrobe and the chronicles of narnia series and all that stuff but he also wrote some deeply meaningful spiritual christian theological stuff and uh, i met a guy uh recently oh i know who it is he he found a c.s lewis book and it changed his life 
uh, and read through, uh, uh, read through a book and it just affected his entire worldview. Um, C.S. Lewis started out not believing in Jesus. Whether he would identify as an atheist or a really strong agnostic, he wasn't always sure. But what he often heard was that when someone asked the question, who is Jesus, these were some common answers. Uh, well, Jesus is a great teacher, great moral teacher. Maybe we agree with that. Okay, hey, talk good things. Turn the other cheek and, you know, don't, you know, don't, don't uh, hate people. And, like, there's a lot of things Jesus said. Matthew chapter 6, read it all. It's good. He's a good moral teacher. Some would say he's a prophet. Uh, some other religious groups would look at Jesus and they would actually include him in their pantheon of prophets. And they would say, yeah, yeah, I mean, he's, he's just among many prophets. Um, but that's not what Jesus said about himself. He said he was the son of God. Um, and he claimed to rise from the dead because he was God in the flesh. That's not what he said. And so C.S. Lewis, he studies Jesus. He becomes convinced. Very smart guy. He becomes a Christian. And this kind of becomes his, uh, his staple statement about this thing. Who, did Jesus, who do you say Jesus is? He says this. He says, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. That I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher. But I don't accept his claim to be God. This is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sorts of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he's a poached egg, or else, don't you love old British people? Like, who says that? On the level of a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell, but you must make the choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or he's a madman, or something worse. Because you can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. You can, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come along with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Wait, are you saying Jesus wasn't a great moral teacher? What C.S. Lewis was saying is like, no, because great moral teachers don't lie and say that they're the son of God. Scam artists do stuff like that. Con men do stuff like that. But he didn't leave it open to be a great moral teacher and not God. So this is called the liar, lunatic, Lord trifecta. That these are some of the greatest options of what Jesus could be. Who was Jesus? Was he a liar? Maybe. I mean, yes, if he wasn't God, then he was a liar. <laughs> was he a lunatic? Okay, maybe we can give him a pass. There's a lot of crazy people out there. Or is he Lord? That's why he did the things he did and said the things he said and went the places he went and rose up the leaders that he rose up because I believe and people who study into him and dive in deeper often decide and are convinced that he is to be hailed as Lord and King, God in the flesh. If you don't have an opinion about this, I want to encourage you to develop one. Think about it. It's a pretty big deal. Because if God did come to the earth in the flesh and offered us a way to eternity with him or separation with God, with our souls, I think that's a big deal. And I hope we can be a church family where no matter where anybody is on that journey, it's a safe place to have that conversation. And that we can have conversations and not fight and argue and scream and yell, but that we can just kind of ask the hard questions. And I'm going to tell you, there are a lot of really good answers to the hard questions. And there are some hard questions that I scratch my head on. I'm like, man, I don't know. Good thing I don't have to know all the answers. That's called faith. Who do you say Jesus is? Simon Peter, of course, is going to be the first one to speak up. Simon says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. After all I've seen, after all I've experienced, I woke on water recently. <laughs> My expectations have lined up with reality, and I'm ready to make a claim. I'm ready to make a confession. This confession is known as the Great Confession. It's a watershed moment for the church. Jesus has decided to make his role on earth clear to his closest followers, and Peter hits the nail on the head. Ding, ding, ding. And so Jesus replies directly to Peter, huh, well, blessed are you, Simon, Son of Jonah. Paul's right there. This is kind of neat because I wouldn't have caught this myself, but smart people who wrote commentaries did. And uh, it's neat because did you notice that what Jesus says here actually mirrors what Peter said to him? Who do you say that I am? I say that you're the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus says, very good, Simon. 
son of Jonah. Neat little Jewish rabbi trick. They're always kind of bouncing things around. You are Simon, son of Jonah. Pretty cool, he says. For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Like, this is a faith move. The fact that you're doing this, you're not just saying this. You believe this. So he confirms this faith decision, and then he comes back with this proclamation to Peter, verse 18. Okay, you've given me a name. I'm going to give you a name, and I tell you, verse 18, that you are Peter. Remember, this is written in Greek. I said he was probably speaking Aramaic. Let's not get in the weeds there. Let's just use the Greek here. (laughs) Petros, Greek word, it means rock. So he says, Simon, son of Jonah, you are rock. And the rock is a firm thing. It's a reliable thing. This is a compliment. He says, and on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Remember where I told you he was? Caesarea Philippi, there's a place called the Gates of Hades, all this other spiritual stuff is happening up there. A lot of people come here looking for truth. I just imagine that Jesus in this moment is like, you are Peter, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the Gates of Hades will not overcome it. No pagan power, no evil demon, no other person that wants to oppress anybody is going to overcome my kingdom. And there's a cool play on words here that happens here with the word rock. We can't really see it in the language because there's so many translations and then English is just like the hardest language in the world anyway. But it, it, there's this thing that happens with the word rock. So he calls him rock. He says, you are Peter, you are rock. And then he lays it, he said, but on this rock I will build my church. And there's a lot of conversation about this. I'm going to tell you what my takeaway is. The rock is this confession that he just made. You are Peter, and based on what you just said, that's a foundation that's going to build a kingdom. What was the confession? What was the foundation? What was the the rock? Well, Peter says, "I, I believe that you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. That confession, that reality that Jesus is preeminent in all the world and that you are Messiah, son of the living God, I'm going to build my kingdom on that idea. Adventure Church, man, we are almost 10 years old. We've baptized almost 70 people. That's super exciting. And every single time someone comes to Jesus, we have them kind of repeat a phrase. And I I tell it to them, like, do you believe this? Because if you believe this, I'm going to get you to say it. And, man, people are proud to say it. And do you remember what they say? A lot of you have been there. A lot of you have been at our baptisms. When someone gets baptized into Jesus with our church family, they say, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And I want to make him the Lord of my life. And then we have our fun venture part we add. And I want to be a God chaser. Because that's one of our core things we try to do, be a God chaser. Over 2,000 years, God has built his kingdom on that great confession. That Jesus was who he says he was. That he was doing what he said he was going to do. And that it would change the world. Life on top of life, on top of life, on top of life. Peter, in his letter, 1 Peter, he says that we are living stones being built into a spiritual house. Stone foundation. He calls Jesus in that same passage. Jesus is the stone that the builders rejected, but God has made him the chief cornerstone. A lot of rock talk. And then life on top of life on top of life gets built and creates this kingdom of God. And it says that we are building a spiritual building so that we can offer spiritual offerings acceptable to God. We become the priest in this new temple. Every person in this kingdom gets to do the very things that Peter begins to do later in his life. We get to invite people into the presence of God. Introduce them to the rock foundation of Jesus, that he is the Christ, the Son of God. And make a difference. And I, one more thing. He tells him, Jesus says, and on this rock, I will build my church. Let's say it again. On this rock, I will build my church. Who does Jesus say will build the church? Who? It's okay. You can talk. Who does Jesus say will build the church? He said he'll do it. On this rock, I will build my church. And sometimes we really get, uh, we get mixed up on this. Particularly church leaders, people like me, people like our elders, you know, and we, we're like, it's up to me. I have to build this church. There's a guy who moved here uh, 11 years ago to be part of starting a brand new church. Like, there were a lot of days where I'm like, whew, it's a lot on me. I got to do this. 
I got to meet these people and do these things and set up these meetings. And yeah, I had a job to do and, and God empowered me to do that. He gave me some skills and some gifts to do that. But like when I finally realized that like without the power of God behind me, nothing will stand. That was a shift in my brain and my heart where I really began to fall in love with God's church. It reminds me of what the Apostle Paul says to the group of the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3. You can read it later if you want to. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, there's this like argument happening among some Christians there at Corinth. And they're arguing over who was the better Christian based on who baptized them. It's a really weird conversation. So some people are like, well, I was baptized by Apollos. You might not have heard of him, but he was a really big church leader in the early days, especially in the Corinthian area. And I was baptized by Apollos. And so other guys are like, Apollos, you know who baptized me? Paul, the apostle Paul. And so there's this argument, and it's really funny, first of all, because Paul's like, I, I don't remember baptizing any of y'all except for maybe this one guy, Stephanus, but I don't think I baptized any of y'all, so y'all just, what are you talking about? But more than that, he says this, he says, listen, I planted seed, and Apollos watered, watered seeds, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants or the one who waters is anything. But only God who makes things grow, the one who plants, the ones who waters, they have one purpose, and they will be rewarded according to their own labor. But we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. Jesus says, okay, you're Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. I will build my church. Guys, as we move over to this new building on Darlington Avenue, can I remind you, it is not yours and is not mine. It's the Lord's for his service, for his work in this city. But with it, God can do amazing things. We're going to encounter new people that we've never seen before. We're going to get the opportunity to be involved in lives that we've never been involved in before. And we don't have to get scared when like, you know, I don't know, the, the bills get hard to pay or, you know, what if somebody, like, breaks in and takes something from the building? Well, we'll steal from Jesus. I guess that's up to you and him. <laughs> and God says, I got you. And I look around the church and I look at missionaries that are serving in very hard areas, areas with serious persecution. And what I see there, the church is growing faster than ever. The church thrives under persecution. The church thrives when there's hardship. You know why? Because Jesus is building his church. He rose from the dead, and there's nothing that he can't do. Every week, uh, I give you a challenge, something you can take home and actually do. Uh, and I hope that you do that. I know that some of you do. I, it's really cool. Some of the conversations that I have, and people are like, hey, I was doing this challenge this week that you gave. And I'm like, you did that? You listened? Awesome. It's cool. I want to give you one that I think you can uh, really manage this week. And it's going to take some time, okay? So if normally you're like, ah, I might slip it in on a lunch break. No, you're going to have to probably sit down with a pen and paper and do this with some brain space. You could jot it down right now, but here's the thing. This week, I want to challenge all of us to write out your own great confession. Who do you say Jesus is? You can borrow from Peter. I say that you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. But in our context, in our language, like, I don't know that we really, like, talk like that, and it doesn't have the meaning that it would for a first century Jew. Jesus is the one who delivered me from my addiction taught me how to love, and I'm going to serve him. Oh, that's different. Jesus is the one who gave me purpose, and I rearranged my life around him because that was more important than what I was doing before. Now, that's a confession. Jesus is my Lord, which means I turned my back on something else that I was serving. That's a confession. And this isn't for anybody else. This is just between you and him, because I feel like Jesus walks up to us and says, hey, who do people say that I am? You heard about me? Okay. Who do you say that I am? What have been your expectations of me? What's your reality? Maybe you've got questions. Maybe you're like, I don't know. I thought this about God and it really hasn't been true for me. That's why we have community. That's why we do this together because maybe you do have questions that you haven't been able to dig out on your own. Take some time this week to write down your own great confession. Who do you say Jesus is? So this week I got to be up in Winston-Salem with 1,600 students, and it was amazing. I mean, just to be in the big room. Go to our Facebook page or our Instagram. We posted, oh, yeah, that's right, we got the picture here. Look at this. That's crazy. That is crazy. Uh, it's also not a great place for people that are claustrophobic, but it's, <laughs> that's amazing. And they're just worshiping the name of Jesus. And when all these kids are in there and worshiping, let me tell you, this is a whole new generation of people right now who are having to answer the question for themselves, who do you say that I am? 
Who do you say that in? What priority do I take in your life? So pray for them, guys. Pray for them and pray for all these students. But um, I want to show you another picture. Check out this picture. These guys? Woo. Hold on. These are ours. And I know I see a couple of you other teens in here too. You're ours too. But man, when they get home, yeah, they're working on their own stuff. But when they get home, you know who they're looking at for the answers to who is Jesus? The only way that they will know who Jesus is is by what we show them. I'm thankful for YouTube and other sources. But their expectations about what God can do in someone's life is only going to be fulfilled or disappointed based on what they see God in doing in the lives close to them. But the pressure is not on you. Jesus said, I will build my church. But you just have to answer the question, who is Jesus to me and what does that mean? Is it going to alter my life or am I just here on Sunday mornings? Is it going to change the way I speak or am I just going to blend in with the rest of the world? Is it going to change the way that I entertain myself? Or am I just going to do the thing that's culturally acceptable right now? Is it going to affect how I spend my money, how I make my calendar? Or am I just going to roll with everything the way that feels good? Who do you say he is? These guys are watching us and there's even more back there and they're younger. And they're even more impressionable. Some of these guys are cynical to the point where they, they know we're all screwed up. We're thankful for that. Uh, two of them are mine. <laughs> they live in my house. <sighs> but what I saw from Peter's great confession is Jesus did not let him down. His expectations met reality, and Jesus will not let you down. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Let's pray.